Welcome Queens to another episode. I have a guest with me today. I'm just going to read out her bio for you. So I have Tony Rudd with me and Tony is a UK registered dietitian and binge eating expert. She helps women who yo-yo diet to stop binge eating to heal their relationship with food so they can eat without restriction and find food freedom. She is health at every size aligned and believes that no matter your size, you are worthy of treatment, which doesn't focus on weight or weight loss goals. I'm so happy that you're on the podcast, Tony. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, You know that I love this podcast, so I'm honoured to be here. (laughs) Yay. Let's dive in. 10 mm-hmm. rapid fire questions. I think you knew this was coming because you're an avid listener. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Number one, your favorite food. My favorite food is eggs. Oh, eggs scrambled, so fried. Versatile. versatile. I like them anyway. <laughs> Love it. Number two, <laughs> the top three books that you would recommend your clients to read or your patients to read. Oh, good one. I recently just listened to, um, I, I listened to audiobooks. So uh, the, you, Your Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Ray Taylor, is it? I don't want to get that wrong. Sonia Marie Taylor. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's another one I've read recently? Um, didn't expect this one. Um, oh, I've also read uh, The Belly of the Beast, which is Sean and Sean someone. We can probably put these in the show notes. Yeah. Just so I don't get the names wrong, but it's um, very much about the black uh, fat male body, uh, which isn't a book that is normally it, which isn't a subject that's really um, spoken about. Um, mm. So I recommend that um, around like the politics of. Um, being fat and in a black body um, I just thought it was really interesting yeah. um, and then another one I always recommend is uh, the intuitive eating books um, I think they're really good um, starter books for people who are interested in the intuitive eating journey awesome thank you I haven't heard of the second one I'm going to check that one out for sure okay mm-hmm. number three I always love hearing this one the worst diet you've ever put yourself on <laughs> Uh, this is a good question. For me, it's low carb. It has to be low carb. I, I love carbs. And if I don't eat carbohydrates, I'm a horrible person. <laughs> angry. <laughs> yeah, very angry. <laughs> Number four, something you like that others may consider strange or different. Um, I'm going to keep it food related because that was the first thing that came to my head. Uh, but I love my mind. <laughs> which is often a love um, or hate uh, love or hate yeah <laughs> I think I hate it I've not tried it for so many years it's those international listeners it's an English it's an English thing right Marmite yeah 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 what it flavor is, is it like, meant to be <laughs> it's like a yeast, it's it's technically a yeast extract and it's like a big it's like a thick uh black color isn't it it's like glue um but it's very nice with butter and toast <laughs> I might give it another go when I'm back in the UK I might try again <laughs> <laughs> it's always it's always good to add a bit of cheese onto it as well it, I think adding cheese to anything is is makes it better I agree with that for sure all right number five what's <laughs> the best thing about your career as a dietitian um, the best thing uh, is for me is uh understanding what people eat I really like being nosy and under- like hearing about what people eat <laughs> it's such a funny thing and not many people share that kind of information with everyone um so yeah I really like to under- like it, like I really love hearing what people eat and what their loves and hates of foods are <laughs> I do because everyone's so different aren't they yeah yeah um yeah everyone is so different in what they like and what they dislike and and their habits around food intrigues me as well yeah me too all right so in (laughs) contrary to that the next question what's the most challenging thing about your career as a dietitian um I think the most challenging thing is um around being thought that we're the food police like we're going to tell people off or what they eat um and definitely in my job I, I 
don't do that at all. I'm far, far from the food police. But I think dietitians historically have a past of being quiet. You need to eat this, you need to eat that. Um, so that's quite a challenge to overcome with people, mm. especially if they've got experience with dietitians. Yeah, I can imagine that, actually. Okay, yeah. number seven, a bit of a different, um, in a different context now. What would you say to your past 10 years younger self? So if you don't mind sharing how old you would be 10 years ago and what you would say uh, to yeah. So I would have been 20 and um, I think that was kind of the prime time that I was stuck in diet culture. Um, so I would kind of, I'd tell her everything I know about dieting now that uh, dieting's up, diets aren't effective. Um, you're just going to gain weight if you keep on kind of yo-yo dieting and um, yeah, and, and there's more to life than cutting out carbohydrates and being boring and angry <laughs> all the time. Uh, you can enjoy food and life without restriction. Yeah, I love that. Do you think yeah. that um older, well, not older, younger version of you would have listened to your advice? Um, no, no, you're probably right. You're probably, that's probably a good question. Um, I don't think I would have because I think diet culture is so strong mm. that it's and if you're really unhappy if you're unhappy in your body, um, it's just so tempting to just keep going on and off those diets and keep trying to lose weight and um, be healthy. Um, yeah, you're right. You had to go through your own journey to get to where you are now. That's for sure. Yes, definitely. Okay. In contrast to that, number eight, go forward 10 years. What do you mm -hmm. think you would ask your future self? So the 40-year-old version of you, is there anything you want to ask her? Um, oh, that's a hard question. I've never, I always think about I always think about your younger your past self, but I never think about in 10 years time. Um, if there's anything I could ask myself in 10 years' time, um I would probably ask myself, was my 30s better than my 20s? <laughs> because I think often as we get to, I think my age, people that like going into their 30s are like, oh, like it's kind of a bit sad. Like people grieve that kind of age. Like I'm not, I'm no longer a 20 year old. Um, so I, I'm optimistic. I think 30s are better than my 20s. <laughs> In my experience, they are. I'm 36 almost. And the, when I turned 30 that's when I started my healing journey so absolutely they're my best years for sure I mean my 20s I learned a lot about what not to do <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> okay so number nine do you have a hobby that you like to do regularly uh, a hobby I just started paddle boarding um so this is I, I, I always recommend clients to kind of do things out of their comfort zone every now and again because I think it really helps with confidence. And for me, confidence has always been an issue all my life with anything that I've ever done. And so this year, I kind of, uh, I'm, I'm going to try something new, which was paddleboarding. And the first time I did it, I was like, I I was so buzzing, like with adrenaline, like I loved it. And I'm doing it once a week now. Yeah. So cool. Because you live in Peru, just so the listeners know, you're not going to go out in the freezing cold in, in the UK to do it. <laughs> no, no, it's it's summer here in Peru now. So I'm making the most of the summer mornings. <laughs> wow, it's beautiful. And the last question I have for you within the, the, the quick fire questions is mm -hmm. what do you want people to take away from this podcast, Tony? So um, to take away from this podcast I want people to realize that um health is more than just your weight um there are so many factors into health and you could be uh what society says is a healthy weight but still have these unhealthy habits around your diet and your lifestyle which actually doesn't make you healthy <laughs> um and the opposite you could be um in I don't like to use the BMI but you could be that in that overweight or higher range and have really healthy lifestyle and habits and that actually makes you more of a healthy person 
Um, mm. So yeah, that's my hopefully my main message from today. I can't wait to dive in. So I think this is so necessary to talk about. Well, before I start asking you questions around that, Tony, can you just share in a couple of minutes, if you can, how and why you became a binge eating dietitian? Like what's what's your journey that led you here? Yeah, um, absolutely. So um, I trained to be a dietitian um, when I was about 21, I think I started, and during that time, I was actually quite, I, I didn't realise it then, but now I understand that how stuck I was in, how stuck I was in diet culture. Um, I was constantly going on and off diets, like really unhappy with my body, like always striving for weight loss, um, exercise, like really um, obsessive with exercise as well during that time. Um, and I think this stemmed from, I have quite a, when, again, when I thought about it more deeply, um, growing up as a child, I was around diet culture as a child. My mum was a Weight Watchers coach. Mm. Um, so I used to attend um, meetings with her more for childcare reasons than my mum making me go to push me about, around that area. Um, so I, I grew up with people being weighed all the time. And uh, and then I also went into being a dancer. So also being in mm-hmm. the dance world, um, I saw a lot of eating disorders, disordered eating type of behaviours as a, as a as a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think as I grew up in my, I stopped dancing when I was eighteen, and um, I I started working at McDonald's and as as what as you would expect, I stopped dancing five days a week and I started eating more and I did gain weight. Um and then going through that kind of then pushed me to be a dietitian to then where I am now. It's quite an interesting journey actually when I've thought about that. Yeah. And you know, thank you for sharing and I think the more professionals in this space that I talk to and myself included I went into my nutrition training, so I'm a transformational nutrition nutrition coach as well as my other as my other qualifications. I started nutrition training because I wanted to fix my relationship with food. I wanted to be really healthy. It's so interesting to see that so many professionals end up in the food freedom intuitive eating space by following their compulsion and obsession around food in the first place, which is why they end up there yeah. and kind of shift their niche to more food freedom intuitive eating so I think that's it's really common isn't it I see yeah yeah and I think also one thing that led me to here now working privately and being like I I say weight inclusive like I don't focus on weight as a goal uh, because as I said like there's so much more factors to help yeah Um, I and constantly being told to lose weight doesn't work in health motivating people and it often means that people who live in larger bodies uh, don't get the right treatment that they need um, for things. And I've experienced that working in the NHS as a dietitian. It's a, it was a very weight-centric kind of place. Um, you only got referred to certain services if, the, if your BMI was particular um, in a particular range, especially with an eating disorders. It's really... Um, really difficult and one reason why I wanted to kind of move away from that and the other ways of treatment yeah I love that and so can you tell me why for those that don't know why is yo-yo dieting really damaging for your health yeah so I mean this is this isn't talked about often Mm. in in a diet culture in in the world of diet culture uh, we are told to restrict food. We need to look at a particular way. Um, we need to be a particular weight for health. And um, the science behind it isn't there. It doesn't actually back it up. Mm. And um, often the number that's thrown around is 95% of diets don't work. But really, if you look at the evidence, I would say probably 100% of the time diets do not work. Um and that's my experience myself and seeing what my, my mum went through as a 
Weight Watchers coach, when she was doing it, she was, she was, she lost the weight. She was able to maintain it. But when she stopped the Weight Watchers, she gained all the weight back small. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. Um, so yo-yo dieting, um, but there is actually evidence to support that, in, um, that if you go on and off diets, um, and your weight kind of fluctuates with that, um, you're actually putting your body in a state of stress, which increases your risk of developing things like diabetes, um, poor heart health, um, low, low bone health, uh, like your bones are weaker, and your muscle mass is lower so you're not as strong um and also it can reduce your immunity so you're more likely to get colds and kind of going up and down in your weight um yeah there's quite a lot of people i think diabetes is a really good example because we're often told um if you're at risk of diabetes the first thing to do you should do is to lose weight yeah um and I think the three main, three big impacts of developing diabetes is your age, which you can't control. As you get into the old age of 30, uh, 40, sorry, you're, you're, you're more likely to develop diabetes as well as genetics. So if there's a family history, mm-hmm. um, especially a post family history, you're more likely to develop it. And then also your ethnicity. So people in, from South Asian, um, also Latin America and Caribbean background are six times more likely to get diabetes than, than people, uh, European white people. So these are things that we can't control that increases your risk. But the first thing that comes to people's heads when it comes to diabetes is to lose weight. Mm. And, um, but we know that yo-yo dieting, because of the stress to the body, are going up and down. Uh, yo-yo dieting actually can increase risk of diabetes as well so can you speak to it sounds obvious from what you're saying but I'm sure you can go into more detail as well if it's if someone goes to the doctors and the doctor's like well you're either pre-diabetic or you have diabetes you need I'm going to sub, um, subscribe not subscribe what's that prescribe that's it prescribe <laughs> I'm so used that's to say fine. subscribe to my podcast and they prescribe <laughs> someone weight loss as the quote mm-hmm. cure. Why is that really problematic for the patient? Again, um, I mean, I used to work in with in diabetes, and I'm actually really interested in uh, diabetes because I've got family history as well. Um, so it's something when I when I qualified, I was like, I want to do, I want to work with people with diabetes, and I saw it all the time. Um, when I first started out as a dietitian, I'd get my job was to see people when they were first diagnosed, and I would only see them once, um, and for a half an hour appointment, and I would have to give them all the information I could in that time, and then they just go up on the way, and I, and I'd never see them again, um, and yeah, it was kind of like the GPs got paid to refer to us, um, for that mm-hmm. advice. Um, so it was the kind of the first first line of treatment. You need to lose weight. Here you go. And I often get people that one example I can think of. I got um, a ninety year old woman newly diagnosed with diabetes referred to me for weight loss, and she was the tiniest, frailest woman. <laughs> um, wow. So often, then I, that makes me think I'd be even thinking about who they are talking to. Um, I, and I, I mean, there's going to be doctors that do and don't. Um, but yeah, that's that's just my experience, really, with that. Um, but we know if you live in a larger body, and um, you've been told constantly to lose weight most of your life, um, and it's called fat shame, isn't it? Isn't it being told to lose weight? And um, and there's quite a lot of evidence that fat shaming doesn't work. Like. It's not working as a as, um, societal message. So why why are practitioners still doing it? Instead, instead, you, I mean, you, you're prescribing weight loss without even understanding what that person eats. Yeah, they might be they, they might live in a larger body and really struggle with their food and really restrict their food. 
um, which most yo-yo yo-yo dieters do yeah I feel like um, I want to say to doctors like okay let's say you genuinely because I believe that doctors honestly are doing the best they can they're in that industry because they to help people right but I want to say okay let's say that you genuinely believe that prescribing weight loss is going to help this person can you give this person or me or anybody in the world a diet or a permanent weight loss solution that actually works that doesn't have yeah. side effects of damaging your mental health creating an eating disorder and all the other side effects that mm-hmm. diets come with that's what I feel like I want to yeah. say because it let's say that it was true that weight loss cures diabetes which it doesn't then how are you supposed to do that permanently anyway there, there's literally no way to do that that is proven that way yeah yeah exactly um and you, you're completely right most diets as well um can lead to disordered eating behaviors which then can lead to eating disorders um yeah. and i think disordered eating is something that's been talked about a lot more recently as you know i mean when i was a dancer I, I was definitely around disordered eating but it wasn't a thing then um but it's definitely been talked about more that this is kind of a start point that can develop into that eating disorder stage um, it is a yeah. society normalized disordered eating behaviors and then they go and put in england anyway in the uk they go and put calories on every menu when they say yeah the health that's calories have nothing to do with health yeah um i remember there was a stage where they were going to put like how much you needed to exercise to burn up like a chocolate bar on, on like labels. No. Um that was definitely considered at one point. And and I mean you, you could we can understand like what how uh how much that would impact our clients and our kind of well most most women <laughs> it, it's not gonna be healthy as for women in particular I'm thinking, but definitely for some men as well. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. how how then is, because I get so many clients and this is, this, of course, I go in depth in this topic in my programs, but when someone says, well, how can being quote overweight be healthy? Can you speak to that? Why is weight actually not equal to health and vice versa? Yeah. yeah I think a really good, a really good, a big topic I talk a lot about it with my clients is the BMI and where that comes from. Um, the BMI was, it was started by, um, it wasn't even, a, um, and it was by some words, men but, in America for like insurance, wasn't it, or something? Yeah, it wasn't even, it was a mathematic, math, mathematician rather than a, um, a scientist around physiology. I'm sorry, there's quite a few birds getting Um and it was focused on mainly white men. The when they built the BMI, it was mainly to focus on white men. And it wasn't even to look at the the weight, was it? It was to do with kind of lifestyle factors of those mm. men. And um it wasn't anyway, it ended up turning to uh the uh, the BMI and it's just kind of been left at that ever since. And I mean, this was like the 18, was it the early 90s, 1900s or? I don't know the days, but that. I, know that, I know that we use, I mean, hopefully I think most people are moving away from it slowly, but I know that it's it's been used so heavily to mm-hmm. quote health, but it's not that at all because people can be naturally in a larger body and be healthy and vice versa so how can someone in your opinion how can someone be quote overweight or fat whatever that means and be really healthy yeah so for me I I look at health behaviors and um making sure you're eating enough food so that your body can thrive is a factor and when it comes to yo-yo dieting you're often restricting your food and putting your body into that stress mode um that it kind of holds on to it. I always explain it like when your body's in a stress, whatever you eat, your body's just going to hold on to it rather than kind of using it for energy and making you thrive across the day, which is health. That's what you, what that's for me is what health is, is your body thriving from 
uh, what you're eating and what you're doing rather than being in that stress mode. That's to me, that's not health. Um, and also like other health behaviors like getting enough sleep, uh, exercising, like I, t- I tend not to say exercise, I tend to focus more on movement because uh, I think often my clients struggle with the word exercise because it's kind of been hammered at them most of their life. They need to exercise, they need to do 10,000 steps, which again is kind of a number plucked from, uh, not from scientific evidence and often very unachievable for most people. Um, so I look at movement in what they enjoy to do rather than what they're forcing their body to do. Um, and also like not linking up those kind of working, like working out to burn calories, to earn food, that kind of unhealthy behavior as well. Um, trying, uh, trying to pull that apart. Um, and it's, it's funny with the BMI because I think in the 70s, a few years ago, um, well, not that long ago, really, it, overnight, people went from a healthy BMI to an overweight BMI because they just decided to lower the numbers. Yeah, I remember reading about um, that. Yeah, so that, that that's another factor why the BMI isn't, it doesn't work for the majority of the people because it's mainly based on white uh white people so if you're if you've got any ethnicity um asian the bmi threshold isn't good for you it doesn't work for you and the same if you've got any sort of disability or uh, i used to work with adults with learning disabilities and we always used the bmi wasn't was effective for them we never really used the bmi with those people so it rarely works for the majority of the people <laughs> Yeah. And what if someone is, let's say, taking BMI out of it, let's say no one, no one didn't know what their BMI was. And someone is in a larger body, let's say a UK size 20 and above. Mm -hmm. And you've got people saying they can't be healthy. What would your argument be for that? I mean, let's be clear, health isn't a moral issue either. We don't have to Mm -hmm. be healthy, like we can do whatever the hell we want with our bodies and our health. And our health isn't in our control anyway, our behaviours are, Mm -hmm. well, that's debatable. But let's Mm -hmm. just keep it on the surface level. What would you say to someone who's like, that person over there who is this size, is not healthy? What would you say in response to that? Um, so I really like to break down the definition of health with these people and really look at, so I look at the BMI and I also look at things like weight stigma and fat phobia, which I think is in our society is very, very present still to this day, even though people are doing amazing work to combat this kind of weight stigma issue, like there's a health exercise model, um, we still read about stuff all the time, <laughs> um, which is it. It's kind of like we're we're battling against a really hard um, society norm, aren't we? Here, <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I would, I would talk to her about um, where that thought has come from. Why, why kind of you think that? Um, and look at redefining health in a way that isn't focused on weight and body size. Um, yeah. Like I said, focusing on those positive health behaviours rather than just like solo weight. I think a, a lot of my clients come to me and they're, they're all, their goal or their life is weight. And they're kind of at that stage where they've tried everything and nothing has worked. Mm. Um, so really recognising that reflecting on like the role that diets have played in your life and often I'm saying diets have never served you a purpose um what 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 are we going to do next okay what's the next step and that's kind of the non-diet approach intuitive eating however people like to call it um is kind of how how you can heal your that relationship with food and move away from weight as a kind of goal yeah, because health to me as well, it's physical, emotional and mental. So if yeah. I decide to sit down and eat a tub of Ben and Jerry's because it's really good and fills me up emotionally, not because I'm emotionally mm-hmm. eating, there's nothing wrong with that either, but because I want to sit and enjoy a tub of Ben and Jerry's and that just really satisfies me emotionally and physically, 
there's nothing wrong with that. If I want to choose yeah. vegetables and salad because I want to get vegetables and nourishment in my body to feel physically good, that's also doesn't mean I'm dieting, right? It's a whole like it's a it's a big question, isn't it? Like what does health mean? But yeah, when we can separate it from health. When we can separate weight from health, I think that's really so important for everybody yeah. going forward and keep it separate. Yeah, for sure. And I think you hit, I think you said something really valuable there that emotional eating or even binge eat, like binge eating or overeating isn't a bad thing, but we've got this kind of restriction is good, uh, binge eating is bad kind of mindset in our society. Um, and often we're correct. If we don't eat, if we go out for a meal and you're battling this kind of eating disorder or disordered eating and you decide not to eat, you're kind of praised. Like, oh, I can't believe you're not eating. That's you're so good. You're so good for having control, or uh, and that's kind of that kind of feeds people in those sticky situations with a disordered eating, eating disorder, don't doesn't it? Yeah, it fe- it feeds it for sure. What what yeah. would you say the difference is in your opinion between binge eating and overeating? I mean, I don't like the context overeating, and if you want to know why, I'll share. But in your professional opinion, what's the difference? Uh, I definitely share with me, but for me, overeating, I don't use it as much, um, but overeating to me is the normal kind of normal process of overeating and being able to kind of just move on. I over it, um, whereas binge eating for me is when that kind of, it often happens alone. Um you get a lot of guilt and shame after it. Um, so that's how I kind of separate the two. Overeating is can happen in with people in a group. I always think at Christmas time when we overeat um, and then binge eating is often something that people battle on their own, that no one else really knows they're going through it and they have that guilt and shame after it. Yeah, the amount of times I've binge ate in cupboards at work, like literally the broom cupboard, I'm not joking, in the toilet, in the car, like literally parking the down car. the road and quickly yeah. like, oh my gosh, you're so right with that. And so with the reason I don't like the term overeating is because, and this is from personal experience, when we have an imaginary line, which most binge eating recovery clients have there's a line of like okay not okay when Mm -hmm. you cross the line of like oh my god I've eaten past fullness I've now quote overeaten it it brings in shame and feeling like failure and like you've done something wrong Mm -hmm. I understand why you're using it because people that don't have a problem would just say oh god I've I've overeaten it doesn't mean anything about them they're not shaming themselves they're just like I'm over full and it's not nice yeah but yeah, I just yeah, wanted yeah. to share that with you. It's just like eating more food than you perhaps want physically. But then honestly, in recovery, I quote, was overeating every day to feel physically and emotionally satisfied. I was still physically uncomfortable, but I needed mm-hmm. to do that. And so I changed it from overeating to eat and pass fullness because it took away like the shame and the judgment that was all coming from my own perception. But it just helps me with the language to like to change that a little bit for me. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting how we can see it differently. Um, yeah, yeah. For sure. And how do you support people to overcome food guilt? Because that's a big one. That's the last thing, yeah. in my opinion, that kind of naturally, the last thing that naturally goes, even if you're physically acting like you're recovering, there's the guilt that's kind of creeping around. Yeah, and the guilt is very common, isn't it? I find, and even, even when I'm with, friends uh, eating a meal they can often express that they're guilty that they had the dessert after their dinner mm. and um, it's something I always again it's quite normally normally spoken about I think uh, yeah. I can't believe I ate that I'm, I'm such a bad person that kind of that kind of language is used quite a lot in, around for the people isn't it um so for me the two things first that I work on I work on kind of challenging those food rules and what I mean by food rules is often is if you put label foods good or bad that's that's kind of for me like a food rule like 
um, and of the money label who's good and bad you put that bad and good onto you as well um so I've eaten that chocolate I'm I'm so bad uh, for eating that and you put that bad word on yourself which then can lead you feeling guilty for eating that food yeah um, and, and the same when you eat if you eat a salad and you think oh I'm being so good and healthy in this again you're putting it on you and you're making yourself feel better just because you've eaten a salad whereas food doesn't have any moral value um you are not a good person for eating a salad and you are not a bad person for eating chocolate or uh, for dinner instead of a meal <laughs> um yeah. it's kind of it's kind of working on that as well as any food rules like a uh, one that springs to mind is uh, like if you feel like you have to clear your plate I think that's one that we've been grew up, we've been brought up to kind of finish what you've got, especially if you experience any food insecurity and food wasn't available to you as a child, um, mm. as much as maybe it is now. You talk, you kind of still grow up with that behaviour, still having to clean your plate. Um, so we, I'd work on stuff like that, and then the other big thing is kind of that all or nothing, um mindset um so i always like to explain it like a pendulum like one top one side you've got the all like uh, donut land and then the other side you've got kind of diet land um so you're either all so i think i've both the wrong way so you're either doing it all which is diet land you're you're restricting your intake you're exercising um your um Counting calories, tracking everything, really for doing it all. But then you swing into the other side of the pendulum, which is donut land, and you're not doing any of it, and you're eating everything and anything you want. So kind of working on that and finding that kind of middle ground of the pendulum. Yeah, I I definitely believe in balance, but then balance that's created as a natural effect from giving up the restriction, tuning into mm. your body, allowing all foods. And then the balance happens naturally because whenever I try to eat in moderation and doing air quotes here, for me, that was still a restriction and I would still end up binging anyway. So I know that moderation yeah. works for some people, especially those that probably haven't got disordered eating and definitely not eating disorders. But yeah. moderation, I don't know how do you how do you navigate that with your clients? Do you do you share not moderation or do you have a different approach? I try not to use moderation and um, another thing I try not to use is little and often I've had a few clients that struggle with that kind of messaging because again I think it's pushed on us that it's just easy to do we should just be able to eat in moderation and if you're struggling with this disordered eating or, or eating disorders particularly um moderation you don't know what moderation is you can't eat it, it it's it's a very broad advice isn't it and it's often yeah. something that I don't advise because I go more specific to specific to help them understand what they actually need to do rather than being it's kind of that eat eat less move more yes. <laughs> which is another one that is very broad and definitely trying to avoid um so for me I I it I really work with the person and kind of come up with really easy goals that fit into their life. Again, everyone is so different. We all do different jobs. Um, we all have different um lifestyles. So finding stuff finding a goal that fits into that life that can improve kind of your health and um go towards push you towards that binge eating recovery rather than pushing you away. Yeah. I have two more questions and I'm going to, which one shall I ask first? I think I'm going to go with the, with the nutrition question first. So in terms of gentle nutrition, and they speak about this in the, in the intuitive eating book, and I speak about this as well, and like adding nourishment in, never taking it away. How can clients who are in recovery from binge eating disorder, how can they start to add gentle nutrition into their life? without it being another diet or something to fail at? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I really like the word gentle nutrition because I think that's exactly what, that's how I would explain my approach because it is gentle. It's never like 
you have to do this, you have to do this. It's never pushed. Mm -hmm. And for me, gentle nutrition, the first kind of step for binge eating eating disorder, the first advice is kind of eating regularly and eating a variety, eating eating enough. Mm -hmm. Eating regularly and eating enough is kind of the first step to binge eating recovery. And so it would be often, in my experience, often people struggle with breakfast, particularly if they binge eat on the evening. Uh, they kind of wake up, I ate so much yesterday, I'm not going to eat my breakfast today. I'll wait till lunch. And that is that is feeding kind of that binge eating restrict cycle. You're just going to keep kind of cycling around that every day or every it, weekends are are kind of one like I'll start again on Monday and um, that's another kind of one I see so after Monday it kind of starts with really li- really small or li- limited or no breakfast um, and then something really small for lunch and then it's you're unable to sustain that past Wednesday Thursday really so I so yeah, eating a regular and eating enough is kind of the first thing for me. And and I would say that's gentle nutrition. And it's kind of, you said it as well, I always focus on what they add into their diet rather than what they can take away, which is what diets are often focused on. You need to cook carbohydrates, you need to watch how much fat you use, you need to, um, can't eat in a certain system. You can't eat at a certain time, uh, those certain sorts of diets. So, yeah, focus what you can add into your diet. And often adding in might be adding in a breakfast every day. Mm. Yeah. And I think um, breakfast, has, breakfast has such a powerful... Um, I often find that when people start eating breakfast, there's so many benefits that come from eating it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I eat... Everyone's different, like you say. I eat my breakfast later, but that's just because of my routine and I'm not restricting right dieting isn't an action it's a state of mind so because I'm not purposely restricting I just listen to my body and eat as soon as possible that fits my routine that works for me and I just want to share something personal I think it will help the listeners in terms of adding nourishment in nourishment and pleasure is are my two main words when I choose what I'm going to eat and so in I was in London this weekend with my mum and we went to an Indian restaurant and I I love an Indian restaurant and I ordered exactly what I wanted. So I think it was a Peshwari naan bread and then a garlic chili chicken, Vindaloo style. And I thought, right, there's no green in there and that's okay, but I want to add some green in. So I had a side dish of like fried spinach with like the Indian cheese in there. And so when it came, mm-hmm. because it tasted delicious, it wasn't like I was force feeding myself. It really tasted nice. I ate the spinach dish first and then continue tuning into my body and then left some naan bread and left some curry because I had enough. So I chose purposely and I can do this because I'm recovered, right? If I tried to do this too early on, it would have mm. gone swinging like the all or nothing kind of thing. And I would have ended up yeah. in myself to eat it all anyway. But because I chose the spinach first, nourish my body with the vegetables Every food is still nourishment, in my opinion. But then I was able to just find, again, natural balance without trying and leave some. And I've got like this big portion of spinach in. So that's just an example of how I navigate adding nourishment in when it makes sense to do so. Yeah, I always recommend like add a bit of joy. I I say like pleasure. You said pleasure, but I always say add a bit of joy into kind of your meal or into your at least once a day add a bit of joy into it um Mm -hmm. because that way you're going to keep that uh, you're going to remind your body that you've not got any restriction uh like you you can you can eat whatever food you want whenever you want it and um when when your body's used to getting that food you kind of let want it less the body's really Mm -hmm. clever isn't it in the way it thinks so clever and it's so funny because it's reminded me of something I used to do and I know the listeners will be able to resonate when I was in my dieting days I'd really be craving like a chocolate bar I would be like okay I'm gonna have a chocolate covered rice cake and then I'll be like still craving (laughs) chocolate then I would have a chocolate protein bar still not hitting the spot and then eventually I'd end up my face off on a shitload of chocolate whereas if I just 
had the chocolate, ate to satisfaction, didn't judge myself, moved on. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's your body. I, definitely, I, I know that people will resonate with that because I know I definitely <laughs> resonate with that. And I've spoken about that on my stories. Like uh, the best thing, if you crave something, the best thing that you could do is just eat it because like you said, you'll try and put, it, it's one people. I want a chocolate bar, I'll have a piece of fruit and that'll help. And then you eat the piece of fruit, no. <laughs> I'll have some water, no. <laughs> it's when people try and not have those alternatives that are nowhere near that thing that you want. So this is a reminder that just eat, eat the chocolate when you want to eat it. <laughs> exactly that. And my client said to me the other day, one of them, she said, because she's in anorexia recovery, so the extreme hunger is like just starting to come in. And she said it's not normal to be this hungry all the time. How can I stop myself being this hungry? And I was like, I can't believe you've asked me that because here's my answer. Eat Mm -hmm. food whenever you are hungry until you are not hungry anymore. And she was like, that was so obvious. I was like, I know, but that's why you have me, right? Because when you're hungry, eat. And when when you're not hungry and you're satisfied, stop. And if you don't stop, it's okay. You can just, you know, continue listening to your body and you can only listen to your yeah. body when you get out of your own way, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think I think that concept is really difficult to understand when you are struggling with your eating and your, and your dieting. But when you when you are recovered and you stop dieting and you welcome all food, it you look back and you kind of think, yeah, that isn't actually, it isn't actually a it's actually quite an easy concept isn't it <laughs> it is it is and my last question to you is if you have a, a newish client who's been struggling with binge eating they've tried everything to stop what steps would you recommend they do whether that's with you on the sessions or they go away and implement it in their life what kind of steps would you guide them to do to start their recovery process the first step I focus on is uh, like that diet mindset like breaking that diet mindset like reflecting on how dieting has served you and realizing that it's it's never worked you've only wasted um you've only wasted money as well as wasted time with friends and family around in that diet culture so i think reflection on that is really important in moving forward away from diet culture if that makes sense um so I do a, I do a bit of mindset work to begin with and make sure that you um kind of moving away from diet culture you kind of give up you, you start kind of tracking apps uh you, I do ask people to not weigh themselves when they work with me because I think often when they do weigh themselves it can be a trigger and mm-hmm. moving towards um back into that kind of restriction mode um so I do a lot of my work and I like focus on like ending up restriction and make sure that you are nourishing your body uh with foods that you enjoy um regularly eating and eating enough is kind of my first steps do you work with clients not with a meal plan per se but with you being a dietitian, do you focus if the client, if it's right for the client, of course, do you focus on ensuring they're getting enough macro and micronutrients balanced throughout the day? Is that something you support them with? So, I mean, meal plans for me, I personally don't use them because I often find people, um, they come to me thinking that they will get a meal plan and it's, I don't think, I don't think meal plans are right. I don't think meal when if you write down Monday I'm going to eat this, Tuesday I'm going to eat this. I can often feel like that feels like a diet again. Like you have to stick with it, and if you don't stick with it, you 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 haven't got control or you haven't got willpower. Um, so I I stay away from meal plans, but I help people with meal prepping instead. Like um, again, I spoke about this on my story yesterday with my close friends and. Um, I talked about kind of writing a meal list rather than a meal plan. So instead of avoid kind of Monday, I'm going to eat Tuesday, I'm going to eat this. Just write your meals down and have that flexibility on when you want them because you could plan a meal for Monday and 
when it gets them a day you might not want that meal um so i think it's really important to have flexibility what you want to eat as well in the time yeah but I, i'm a big i'm a big fan of not wasting food and uh, so i really want to help people understand that you can eat healthy and and not waste food or it doesn't have to be expensive to have a healthy diet um so i work a lot with people on that as well yeah what does healthy mean to you like when you say healthy, healthy diet or healthy food like does that mean like no, no processed food whole foods no for me healthy is um a balanced food yeah a balanced meal so you've got all the food groups and i think processed food is has got a bad breakfast in it when you said that i was like you know i definitely uh, processed food most food we eat is processed <laughs> and I think people forget that we often think it's just that high salt kind of ready meals but even if that those ready meals might be really um helpful for some people in order to get nutrition into their body and yeah. often they're quite balanced they've got a bit of protein they've got a bit of um carbohydrate and they've got a little bit of veg in it and so I always it, I mean, then they're not unhealthy. They're not the healthiest. They're definitely not healthy. Uh, but they all, if that if that person was to choose between not eating and having a processed meal, the healthiest option is to have a processed meal. Yeah, if that makes sense. I hope I've, I hope I've explained that in, in yeah, no, in a it makes way. absolutely makes sense to me. It goes back to everyone's different, and if someone's working two jobs or working twelve hour shifts and there is a choice between a ready meal in the microwave with some protein, carbs, fats, and veg in, or mm -hmm. a bag of mini eggs, which yeah. is also fine. But the mini eggs only alone are going to have, as you know, cause a massive sugar spike. They're going to feel shit. And so I encourage like three balanced meals a day plus whatever else they want in between, just yeah. because it makes you feel good in your physical body and it nourishes you. So I was just curious from a diet dietitian's perspective, what healthy yeah. meals to you yeah and healthy is it is kind of a word that's been overused for a lot of people at mm home -hmm. now and um i often try and use like balanced eating more often and um, especially online um, but healthy sometimes it just comes out because we're just so used to saying it aren't we as a society um but yeah like you said it when it comes to like it comes back to that good and bad food isn't it and unhealthy, unhealthy, it's kind of in the same category as that. Um, again, you when you've eaten what you think is a healthy food, you think you are healthy. And if you've got eaten something that you think is unhealthy, you think you are unhealthy. So it, it is kind of in the same category as that. Um, yeah. It is. That's why I use the word processed, not junk, because most people would say, oh, junk food, but junk really I mean even if you literally eat yeah. sugar in a bag which I've done that once in a binge I'm not shitting you even if you did that it's not very nourishing but it's still carbohydrates it's still energy it's still glucose so yeah if we get our if we open our minds to like not like you say not the black and white foods not the good or bad it's not mm -hmm. junk it's simply just processed food and that's okay just offer yourself yeah. nourishment throughout the day adding what you want yeah. I think yeah this has been yeah a really helpful conversation Tony so is there anything you want before I ask where we can find you is there anything that I've not asked you or anything you want to say to the listeners before we say goodbye um no there's nothing in particular but I, I mean if you are struggling with kind of binge eating or binge eating disorder you often think you're alone in your habits and that you if there's something wrong with you and um, we kind of want to spread that message that you're not alone um it's not your fault you don't need any more willpower or control it's nothing to do with that and if you need support reach out to to people like us who focus away from diets is really important in recovery yeah thank you tony and where can we find you and how do you work with clients yeah, so I am mainly on Instagram. I am at the dot binge dot dietitian, and um, 
I work with clients one to one mainly, um, either weekly or bi weekly sessions. Um, so, yeah, um, if you've got any questions, uh, drop me a DM on Instagram, is probably the best way I, I tend to respond quite quickly on that. Awesome. Obviously, everything will be linked in the show notes, so you can just click on and go and follow. So, thank you for this conversation, Tony. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me again. You are welcome. And Mm -hmm. listeners, I will see you on the next one. Much love.